Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you decided to join us today, even though you didn't know what today's message would be about. In fact, I wasn't sure either, because how do you follow on from The Chosen? I sincerely hope you enjoy that series as much as I have and that you really found yourself growing in faith or maybe taking a step of faith for the very first time. It's my prayer that God will continue to use that series to touch people all over the world. Now, I asked the question, how you follow on from The Chosen, a little bit tongue in the cheek, but there's actually a real question lurking in there. How do you follow after The Chosen? Because the invitation throughout the series was to follow Jesus. And I think many people may wonder what exactly that may mean. There may even be a bit of trepidation and some of you may be a bit wary of totally surrendering to following Jesus. Because what if he wants you to go and tell like the woman at the well? Or what if he leads you to speak to other people about him and you don't have anything to say? Or what if he leads you to give to people in need and you don't have anything to give? What will you do then? What if you're embarrassed and God doesn't come through for you? Friends, these are real concerns and they can easily stop you from following Jesus as fully as you want to. However, what I've discovered is that when God calls you, he also equips you. In fact, he promised in Matthew 10, and don't worry about what you'll say or how you'll say it. The right words will be there. The spirit of your father will supply the words. You know, ever since I started preaching more than 20 years ago, I've had this worry at the back of my mind. What if I have nothing to say? What would happen if I just cannot hear God and I do not have anything to share on a Sunday? And that's quite a scary thought for me. In fact, I've had some nightmares about it. However, despite that fear, the God who called me to his service has always provided me with everything I needed to do what he called me to do. He's always equipped me, sometimes in miraculous ways. I remember one year I went with a team to Romania and a church there asked me to preach on a Sunday morning, which I did. But then on a Sunday evening, they asked us to visit another church. And like usual, we sang a few songs as a team. We had a testimony or two, and one of the team members delivered a great message. We had all the bases covered, and I don't, didn't think that I needed to speak as well. But I was wrong. The next moment, a translator said to me that they wanted me to speak to them as well. And I was like, but I preached this morning. I didn't prepare anything for tonight. And she said, well, they're waiting for you. And I remember so well the feeling in my stomach. It was like I was going into exam for which I didn't open a book. I felt as unprepared and underqualified and out of my depth as I've ever felt in my life. So I walked up to the lectern and as I stood there, my mind was totally blank. So I first looked up at my team and I mouthed to them, I have nothing. And then I looked up into the eyes of 200 people, looking expectantly at me, hoping to hear a word from God. And I felt incredible compassion for them. And all I did was open my mouth. And the words just started coming out. It was absolutely incredible and an amazing faith-building adventure for me. And so I know that God equips when he calls. However, it doesn't mean that I'm not still scared at times that I might have nothing to say. However, it's dawned on me that it's similar to being a newspaper delivery boy or girl. When they go to the depot, they're not scared that the newspapers may not be there. That's the last of their worries, because it certainly isn't their responsibility. All they need to do is deliver the message that's waiting for them. It's the same when God calls you to say something. He is the one who will equip you and give you the right words at the right time. Our task is just to be willing to deliver when he calls us to. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because I'm wondering whether you sometimes feel like that as well. And not just when it comes to speaking to others, but also taking a step of faith that you just don't have enough to give. Maybe you feel that God has asked you to assist someone or a specific cause financially, and you feel that you ca just cannot do it that you just don't have enough to help the way you would like to. Or maybe you see a need in your community or in your family or in your neighborhood and God is pressing that on your heart and you feel called to do something about it. You feel that it is what it would mean, mean to follow Jesus in that situation. You just don't think that you can give and what you can give can really make a difference. And the result of feeling called to respond to a need that's too big for you is to feel overwhelmed and inadequate like you're not good enough, 
that you will not be able to do anything about it. And no one likes to feel that way. So it's easier to just ignore it or to say that you cannot help right now. However, friends, we are called to follow Jesus. And that means that if he leads us to take a step of faith, that we should take it, even if it is difficult. Now, with all that in mind, let's read a story of some early followers of Jesus who felt similar. If you've been watching The Chosen, you will know that Jesus was calling his disciples one by one to follow him. And after they followed him for a while, though, he started sending them out two by two to also preach the good news and heal some people. And what is really interesting is if you read a passage that precedes the one we're going to focus on today, you'll see that Jesus told them not to take bread or a bag or even money in their belts. In other words, he wanted them to learn to trust God to provide for them whatever they needed. And when they came back, they obviously had a lot to tell Jesus of how God provided for them and what he did through them. So let's pick it up there in Mark 6 verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. They must have been so excited. What they saw Jesus doing, they were now also doing it. However, they probably all needed a break as well, as they probably felt at the end of what they could give, like they didn't have any more to give. Also, we read that Jesus got some bad news just before they returned. The guy who baptized him, John the baptizer, was beheaded. And so Jesus probably also needed some time away from the hustle and bustle. Verse 31. Then, because so many people were coming and going that I did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. It was time to reflect on everything that happened and to just recharge a bit. It sounds like a great plan. We all need that from time to time. Sometimes we are just so tired that it is hard to carry on. And what I find interesting is this year is that you would think that people wouldn't need a break because the whole year has been a big break from the usual. Many people had an opportunity to come to a standstill this year and review their situation. And that was good. However, far from being energized by it all, it sounds to me as though people are quite worn out right now. So many people I speak to are tired of the emotional and the mental toll the whole COVID-19 pandemic has been taking on them. And I think if we could get away from it all, we would probably all jump at a chance. Unfortunately, though, we cannot, and neither could the disciples. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. They haven't even got to their destination yet and the people were already waiting for them. Verse 34, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Now I'm sure the disciples were disappointed when they saw the crowds because they were probably looking forward to having a bit of a break. But when Jesus looked at the crowds, he immediately saw the need and he was filled with compassion for them. And his compassion immediately translated into practical help. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. When it got late, the disciples were probably glad that their long day was finally over. At least they could have a break, and so they asked Jesus to send the people away because what they had was not nearly enough to feed so many people. But he answered, you give them something to eat. Now that must have been quite a shock to them. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Now at this point, what you need to remember is that they just returned from a trip where they didn't take any bread along. Yet God provided everything they needed. Yet when they saw all the people, they didn't think of how God provided in the past. They just thought of how difficult it would be to feed all those people. They looked at the problem instead of at their provider. And it's here that our lesson for today starts. Because I believe that the rest of the story gives us a few powerful questions. That if we incorporated it into our thinking, that it would change our perspective when we feel we have nothing to give. When we feel we've run out of resources to help other people and Do what God is calling us to do. So here's the first one. Question one. What do you have? The disciples had quite a strong and actually a bit of a sarcastic response when Jesus told them to feed the people. It's like, have you seen how many people are listening to you? Six months salaries would not be enough to feed all of them. 
are you sure you want us to do that? However, Jesus was not bothered by their reaction. He still wanted them to learn something. And so he asked them very simply, how many loaves do you have? He asked, go and see. In other words, don't focus on what you can't do or what you don't have. Tell me what you do have. When you feel you're at the end of what you can handle and God asks you to do what looks impossible for you to do, the next question for you is, tell me what you do have. Friends, this is similar to the question God asked Moses when he was called as well. It looked pretty impossible for Moses to go and speak to the Pharaoh and lead his nation out of captivity in Egypt. And so when he protested, God simply asked him, what's in your hand? Translated, Don't tell me what you cannot do. Tell me what you do have. As it turned out, it was his staff. And through that staff, God did quite a few miracles. And therefore, this is a very powerful question when Jesus asked his disciples, what do you have? So can I just ask you the same? What do you have? Lord, I cannot help all those people in need because there are so many people struggling without food. There are so many people who do not have adequate sanitation. There are so many people who are dying because of a lack of clean water. Uh, There are so many people who are scared and fearful and depressed. Uh, What can I do? Lord, the problem is my family is so big. How can I possibly be of help to anyone? Lord, I've been hurting so much. I I just don't think I have what it takes to forgive them for what they did to me. Friends, when you feel tired and worn out and overwhelmed by the situation you're facing, the situation God is calling you to? Stop thinking what you can't do or don't have and start asking a powerful question. What do you have? What can you do? Maybe you don't have millions of extra cash lying around, but you can spare an extra 50 or 100 pounds per month to help people who do not have food to eat. Maybe you don't have the psychological skills needed to help people in your family overcome what they are struggling with. But you can support them and you can show them unconditional love. Maybe you don't always know what to say to people who are fearful of the future. But you can be an agent of hope rather than an agent of despair. Maybe you cannot go back and change the past. But you can forgive those who hurt you and thus let go of the hatred and the bitterness that has been engulfing you. Friends, stop looking at the problem and start looking at your provider. Because he is ready to use whatever you are willing to entrust to him. Which brings us to the second powerful question. Are you willing to give what you have to Jesus? All the disciples gathered some information. They came back and they said, when they found out, they said, five and two fish. In John's account of the same story, we hear that it was a boy who gave them the loaves of bread and the fish. Now this boy could have kept it for himself and he would have had a pretty decent dinner. But he didn't. Think about it. In a crowd of that size, which we discover later on, would have been around ten to 15,000 people when you counted the women and the children as well. There probably was more than just one little boy who had some food with them. However, he was the only one who was willing to give it to Jesus. He was willing to place everything he had in Jesus' hands. And so here's my question for you. Are you willing to give whatever it is that you have to Jesus? Whether that be your resources, your talents or your skills. Are you willing to do whatever you can for his honour and his glory? I mean, you can keep it all to yourself and enjoy a pretty decent dinner. A pretty nice and very comfortable life. Or you can place it in Jesus' hands. You can trust him with it and see him bless thousands of people through it. It's not enough to just know what is in your hands. You've got to be willing to surrender it to Jesus. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Jesus did something here that's mentioned in several other places, like the time when he raised Lazarus from the dead. And that is before the miracle occurred, he looked up and he thanked God in advance, before it happened. So here's the question. Do you thank God before or after the miracle? 
Unfortunately, many people don't even thank God after a miracle either. But a point I want to make is that Jesus was so in tune with his heavenly father and he trusted him so completely that he thanked him in advance. Now, friends, I'm not saying that a miracle you're waiting for is going to happen in the way you want it to happen when you want it to happen. We don't know that. But I do know that God wants us to trust him with it. He doesn't want us to pray half-heartedly, but he wants us to approach him expectantly, trusting that he will do precisely what is best. Which brings us to another interesting observation about a disciple's behavior at this stage. Maybe they remembered something of what occurred previously, that whenever Jesus was in control, miracles seemed to happen. Either way, they did exactly what he told them to do. They made all the people sit down in groups and then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. Now remember, at this stage, the miracle has not occurred yet. They just saw Jesus break what was given to him. And yet, they did exactly what he told them to do. They may have thought they'd look stupid handing out five loaves and two fishes to thousands of people. They may have thought they'd be embarrassed. However, they still did exactly what he told them to do. They trusted him fully. Friends, will you do that? Will you act even before the miracle occurred? Sometimes we need to start moving before we will see what God is doing. We need to take a step of faith. And that means we will not always see how everything will fit together. We will not always understand. And sometimes it may not even make sense logically to us. Yet we are called to take a step of faith, not just think about faith. We are called to act. So friends, maybe there's something you need to do. Maybe it will take you to pick up the phone and speak to that person whom you haven't talked to for years. Maybe you need to forgive someone. Or maybe you need to contact someone and ask for forgiveness. Maybe you need to enroll in a course or maybe you need to phone a counsellor. Maybe you need to get involved with the issue that has been pressing on your heart for so long. It may be time for you to stop thinking about a miracle and start doing what God is calling you to do. Which brings me to the last question or the last lesson from this story. Do you expect God to provide in abundance? I think we sometimes have very low expectations of God because we don't want to set ourselves up for disappointment. However, what has struck me as I have witnessed some of the miracles Jesus did through the Chosen series is just how abundant and exuberant Jesus' miracles was. When the leper asked for help, Jesus healed him fully and immediately. When the paralyzed guy was brought to Jesus, he didn't just make him feel better. He made him walk and he forgave his sins. He freed Mary. He provided for Simon. He gave Matthew a whole new life. And when he changed water into wine, he didn't stop with a jug or two. He changed hundreds of liters of water into wine. He provided whatever was needed in abundance. And the same thing happened with the five loaves and two fishes. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. Jesus made sure there was enough for everyone. They could all eat until they were satisfied, until they had enough. And afterwards, when they picked up all the pieces, they had 12 baskets full. Now, I find that incredibly significant because how many disciples were there? 12. One whole basket full of food for each one of the disciples, even when they had nothing to start with. It was like Jesus was saying to them, and maybe to you today as well, Even if you have nothing left to give, I will provide for you what you need. And I will provide in abundance. When God calls, he equips. Friends, I want to invite you to trust God with whatever you are struggling with right now. He knows the challenges you are facing. He knows that you may be tired and worn out right now. That it feels as though you cannot take another step. He sees you and he wants to be involved in your life and help you and give you strength for whatever it is that you are facing. So stop relying on yourself and your own plans and put your trust in Him, trusting that He will lead you and that He will provide for you whatever you need. And therefore, just think of the situation you are in right now. 
and ask these five powerful questions and see what answers come up in your heart. What do you have? Are you willing to give it to Jesus? Will you thank him even before the miracle occur? Will you act before the miracle occur? And do you expect God to provide in abundance for you? Friends, may God use these five questions to change your perspective as he works a miracle in your life. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you so much that you are inviting each one of us to follow you and to trust you, even with the little we have. Lord, you know that we so often feel we're running on empty, that we just don't have the strength to make a difference anymore. Thank you that we can read a story like we did today and know that we are not called to do the miracle, only to bring our five loaves and two fishes and trust you with them. That is what we want to do today. Lord, what we have, we give to you. Please use it and please use us the way you want to. In Jesus' name we pray. Please receive God's blessing and trust him with whatever you have. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.